we're going to now start to look at measures of location, or assume some people refer to them as measures of position. So a measure of location is a method by which the position that a particular data value has within a given data set can be identified. The most common measures of location are percentiles, quartiles, and z-scores. And my guess is at some point you've heard of the term percentile, maybe you've heard of quartiles, and you likely haven't heard of z-scores. And whether you've heard of them or not, no problem, we're gonna go over them now. Uh, so for a percentile, a percentile is a number that divides the ordered data into hundredths. All right, percentiles may or may not be part of the data set. So it's possible that the score for a percentile is not actually a data value in your data set. But that's the, the numerical answer for the percentile. It happens all the time. Uh, so for percentiles, again, it divides our data into hundreds, and it just tells you where you are in between low and high. Uh, so where I first encountered percentiles was back uh, in high school when I was taking the SATs. So I'll, I'll give you a for instance. So when I took the SAT English, I took them both on the same day, but when I got my score for the SAT English, I scored in the 10th percentile. Okay, which means the score I earned, and I don't quite remember what my actual score was, but let's just say I, I got a 250. It means 10% of the folks or of the students that took the SAT English during that same time frame that I did, that same test. So 10% of the folks scored my score or lower. This is like a cumulative relative frequency happening all over again. And before you feel too bad, on the flip of that, okay, English was never my strong suit. Uh, for the SAT math, I scored in the 99th percentile. All right, which means 99% of the students who took the test that, uh, that time out scored my score or lower. Or another way of saying that is only 1% of the students who took the test that during that time, that year, scored higher than me. Okay, so percentiles. All right, these are like cumulative relative frequencies, that term that we talked about back in chapter one. Okay. All right, so cumulative relative frequency, or very uh, often you'll hear me refer or use the phrase, it's an on down measure. All right, so 10% of the students who took the SAT English that, that year scored my score or lower, or my score on down. Uh, in terms of quartiles, quartiles are very similar to percentiles, but instead of breaking your data into hundredths, it breaks it into quarters. And you can think about a dollar, right? What is a quarter worth? It's 25 cents, right? Hearing that word cents, cent is 100. So quartiles, Instead of saying you're in the first percentile, second percentile, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth, ninth percentile, whatever it is, we will break you up into the first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, fourth quartile. So instead of breaking things into 100, we're breaking them into four, and then we're gonna get the lower and upper quartile. So the lower quartile is the median of the lower half of your sample, or I could say it's the cutoff for the bottom 25% of your data. Sometimes it's referred to as the first quartile. So let's try and give some more context to this. When you hear me talk about the lower quartile, we also call it the first quartile. We tend to give it the symbol Q sub one. So if you see Q sub one, we're talking about that first quartile. This is also equivalent to the 25th percentile. So if you're rocking the 25th percentile, we consider you in the first quarter of our data. Right, so the first quartile or the lower quartile. And it's the median of the lower half of your data. So if you remember from our previous example, if we had our data set and we put it in order from low to high, we would pick that middle number or maybe that middle two numbers to get our median. Well, once we find that middle, we've got the lower half of our data and the upper half of our data. So if I took the median of the lower half of the data, that would be Q1 and then which we're about to get to, if I take the median of the upper half of our data, that would be Q3. So I'm taking half of a half and it breaks it up into quarters. So the upper quartile is the median of the upper half of the sample, 
Or you could say it's the cutoff for the top 25%. Maybe you want to phrase it as the bottom 75%. And we also call that the third quartile. So the upper quartile or the third quartile gets the symbol Q sub 3 and it is the 75th percentile. Okay. If I want to find the IQR, all right, the interquartile range, well, let's, let's review up this idea of range. Range was always high minus low, right? Highest data value minus your lowest data value. Subtract those two numbers, that was your range. Interquartile range is high quartile minus low quartile, or upper quartile minus lower quartile. So we're gonna define IQR, the interquartile range, to be Q3 minus Q1. Whatever that number is, that's our IQR. Officially, I could say the IQR, it's a resistant measure of spread, and it's given by upper quartile minus lower quartile, or in symbols, Q3 minus Q1. If you remember this phrase, resistant, all right? If we talk about resistant, what are we resisting in stats? We're resisting outliers. The reason that the IQR is resistant is because the IQR is the middle 50% of your data. All right? And anything in the middle, right? if I have the middle 50%, it's not getting affected by what's happening on the outsides there. So our IQR, it cuts off the middle 50% of our data, right? And then because it's the middle 50%, it's not being affected by what's happening on the outsides of our data, the highs and the lows, and that's where the outliers live. All right, one other formula we got going on here, z-scores, okay? So this, this term, this z-score vocab term, this is gonna come back around in chapter six. We are going to revisit this. We're going to start in on z-scores when we start talking about the normal distribution. And once we get on the normal curve, the bell curve, we never leave it. Stats folks are obsessed with the normal distribution. And this is just your first look at it. So z-scores can be crunched for any data point or any data value. You take your value, subtract the mean, and put it in ratio to the standard deviation. So the formula for a z-score, you'll hear me repeat, value minus mean over standard deviation. So that's our official formula for the z-score. And what the z-score tells us is it tells us how many standard deviations our value is from the mean. It's positive or negative according to whether the value lies above or below the mean. So these z-scores will tell you, hey, you scored, your, your particular score was one standard deviation above the mean your particular score was one standard deviation below the mean. You were two standard deviations above or two standard deviations below. And it doesn't have to be a whole number. Your z-score could be 1.7. But it's gonna tell you if you score above the mean or below the mean, just depending on whether z is positive or negative. All right, so with that, before we get to example four or before we revisit example four, let's just take a moment and play out this upper quartile, lower quartile IQR with some simpler data sets. So when we encountered example four last time, before we got to it, I put forward these three little data sets just so we could practice the mean and the median. And I think it'd be a good time just to bring those back. And now let's focus on Q1 and Q3. So if you remember, anytime you wanna find a median, you put your data in order, low to high, and if you have an odd number of observations, boom, there's my median, okay? So that's how we got the three here. If you recall for the mean, I added these five digits up, one plus two plus three plus four plus five, divided by five, and I got three. But now let's focus on how we find the lower quartile. So if I flip back for a moment to that previous page, it says the lower quartile is the median of the lower half of your sample. So let's take a look at this. So I've got my median. It cut my data in half, right? And here is my lower half, and here is my upper half. So I need to find the median of these two numbers. And if you remember, if you have an, an even number, right, a middle two or two middle numbers, you take the average. So for Q1, I would take one plus two and divide it by two and get that my first quartile is 1.5. For the upper half, for Q3, I need to average four and five. 
So for Q sub 3, I would do 4 plus 5 and divide that by 2, and I would get 4.5. So that's how I could go ahead and put a little bar there just so we can separate it. That's how I would find my Q1 and my Q3, my upper quartile and my lower quartile. Now, just to extend this a little bit, and I know I'm kind of running out of room, I'm into the margins. All right, if I wanted to, let me go up here just so we can see it. If I wanted to find my IQR, I would simply go Q3 minus Q1, right? And so this is interquartile range. If we remember range was high minus low. So interquartile range is high quartile minus low quartile. So in this case, that would be 4.5 minus 1.5, which would just be 3. Okay, so out of my simple, my most basic data set, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there's the mean, there's the median, Q1, Q3, and the IQR. I could also quote the spread and the range, and we're starting to round out all of our socks. Okay, so for data set 2, I chose these five data points because I wanted to demonstrate uh, a little while ago about medians being resistant to outliers, but means getting affected by outliers. So we saw, again, previously, right before example four, that the median stayed the same, but the mean got affected by the outliers. So again, we call the mean, it is a non-resistant stat, or the median is a resistant stat. Medians can resist outliers, because the medians deal with what's happening in the middle of your data set, but outliers are on the outside. All right, here we go. So for the median, again, I knew it was three. All right, now here's the lower half of my data set. Here's the upper half of my data set. So let's go find Q1 and Q3. So Q1 in this case, I gotta find the median of the lower half of my data set. So we're gonna go one plus two divided by two. So that's, again, 1.5. For Q3, this time I'm gonna do four plus 100 divided by two. And what do we have going on here? So let me get my handy dandy calculator and we will, excuse me, go 104 divided by two and we'll get 52. All right, and if I wanted to find that IQR, we would do Q3 minus Q1. So in this case, we would do 52 minus 1.5, and we have a much larger IQR. And I know on the previous page I said, hey, IQRs are resistant to outliers, and typically they are. That's, that's really solid advice. The reason you see the IQR getting affected so drastically in this particular example is because there's only five data points. Whenever there's only five data points, things they, they might get severely affected by outliers. The median didn't in this case because it's in the middle, and, and typically, well not typically, always, we say the IQR is the middle 50% of your data. And usually it doesn't get affected by outliers, but again, because there are just such a small number of data points, it, it is getting affected by outliers in this particular example. All right, so let's take a look at data set number three. All right, this is when we bump this up to one, uh, six data points of one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so when I go to look at this one, right, the mean and the median, they were both here. So the median in this case was 3.5, right? Split my data right in half. And here is the lower half of my data, and here is the upper half of my data. Now, if you look, the lower half of your data has three points. So if you wanna find the median, here's the median of the lower half of your data, which we're gonna call Q1. And on the flip of this, Here's the median of the upper half of my data, which I'm gonna call Q3. So in this case, we've got Q1 equaling two, Q3 equaling five. So if I wanna find the IQR, again, we're always looking at Q3 minus Q1, high quartile minus low quartile. So we've got five minus two, which is three. All right, so this is the lower 50% of your data. This is the upper 50%. This is the first 25%, the second 25%, the third 25%, and the fourth 25% when we break them into quartiles. Or another way of saying this, again, this is the middle 50% of my data. 
And once you even get to six data points, you, you'll start to see that outliers don't make a difference. Where the 100 did make a difference here because we only had five data points, it was so small. Imagine if I had changed this to 100. Okay. If this was 100, would the mean change? Absolutely. Would the median change? Nope, it would still stay 3.5. Would Q1 change? Nope, it would still be two. Would Q3 change? Nope, it would still be five. So as soon as you get six data points, you can start to see that Q1 and Q3 are resistant stats, right? The IQR is a resistant statistic. The median and the IQR are great resistant statistics. Whenever I have outliers, I tend to use these measures for my measure of center and my measure of spread, or the C in SOX and the S in SOX. So I, I use those when outliers are present. All right, so with that, let's flip back to example four and see if we can find all of those statistics I asked for. So we're back with our example four again, trying to find, in this case, the value of the first, second, and third quartiles, find the IQR, and then what value represents the 50th percentile, and then right at the bottom, I'll ask you to calculate a, a z-score. All right, so if I wanna find a whole bunch of statistics, it's one bar stats. That's where you're gonna find all of these. But let's start to pick apart what these are. All right, so when you hear first quartile, we have a symbol for that. We know that's Q1. The second quartile is actually the median, okay? So you can label it Q2. You can say median. You can say 50th percentile. They all mean the same thing, okay? And then we need Q3. So we basically need Q1, Q2, Q3, but I just want you to hear that Q2, we don't usually refer to this as the second quartile, but it's possible. We usually just call it the median. It's also the 50th percentile, right? Just like the first quartile is the 25th percentile, the third quartile is the 75th percentile. We've got multiple names for the same position in your data set, just depending on how you're breaking it down. Are you breaking it down by quarters? Are you breaking it down by percents? All right, so let's take a look at this. What is the value of Q1, Q2, Q3? And then we gotta find the IQR. And then here we go, what value represents the 50th percentile? Well, we just said the 50th percentile is the median. So this question is a repeat of this question. The second quartile is the 50th percentile. So recognizing that those are the same, same term, the same vocab term, means if you don't really have to find any new information for this question, we'll just repeat our answer. All right, so I'll get my calculator up. I'm gonna hit stats. Oops, let me turn it on, I'll hit stat. I should have my data in there. I also have something in L2. All right, let's make sure I have 40 data points. Yes, if I'm looking, my 41st entry is my first blank entry. That's a good sign. Uh, so I wanna do stat calc, enter, and I wanna feed my calculator L1. So we can see the mean, the sums of all the, the values, some of the squares of all the values. There's our standard deviation. There's the variance, uh, excuse me, the population standard deviation. Again, this is the line that we will never use. So don't use that. It's, it's, it's a number that your calculator is crunched that we don't use in this class. So if I scroll down here, I can start to see min, there's Q1, median, Q3, and the max. So here it is. Here's Q1, here's Q2, and here is Q3. So let me go transfer that onto my paper. So Q1 is equal to 4.5. Q sub 2 is equal to 13. And Q sub 3 is equal to 20.5. Now, the units for this were web page access times, or times web page was accessed. Let me spell that better. And I'm gonna use quote marks here. let's just start to talk about what these numbers mean. So Q2 is our median. That means half of the students in this class 
access the web page 13 or more times and half web, uh, uh, and half access the web page 13 or fewer times. It's the 50th percentile, so half the students more than 13, half under 13. All right, let's think about 4.5, all right? 4.5, it means 25% of my students access this web page four and a half times or less. And I'll give you again, four and a half, it's not a possible variable value. That happens plenty of times where, where the actual quartile or percentile you get is not part of your data, but numerically there it is. So about a fourth of my students access the web page four and a half times or less. But 75% of my students access the web page 20.5 times or less. All right, so again, we're using that or less, that on down, that same type of write-up that we used back in chapter one when we were talking about cumulative relative frequencies. All right, so let me make sure I'm answering every question asked of me. What is the first, second, and third quartiles? Got it. What is the IQR? I, I need to still do that one. So IQR would be Q3 minus Q1, and in this case, that would be 20.5 minus 4.5, which is 16. And the units for the IQR are the same as the units for your, your variable. So we've got times web page accessed. All right. Another way of saying that is half of your students access the web page somewhere between 4.5 times a month and 20.5 times a month. Right? This IQR includes 50% of your students. All right, the last thing that was asked of me was what was the value of the 50th percentile? So the 50th percentile, it's the median, so it's 13 times web page accessed. Or you could say web page access times, something that conveys context. All right, this now asks what is the z-score for the outlier? So we're gonna go with this outlier, 331, that student that went on that web page 331 times in a month. I mentioned previously 84 is also an outlier. So, <coughs> excuse me, you could calculate the z-score for each, but I'm gonna do the most extreme outlier here. So anytime you wanna get an outlier, it is value minus mean in ratio to the standard deviation. So let's take a look at how we're going to crunch this. And you might be thinking, okay, well, how do I find the value? How do I find the mean? How do I find the standard deviation? All right, the value is your particular data value. And in this case, it was 331. All right, the mean is something that you can get from one variable statistics. And we had found it previously. If you don't remember, you can always scroll back up to the top and you see that it was 23.1. All right, and I need to put it in ratio to the standard deviation. And again, we will never use this sigma number. We're gonna use the S number, so 52.33. Okay, now with that, you wanna be careful on how you do fractions in your calculator. I've seen it too many times where we're not using the correct parentheses, and then we wind up getting a number other than what we want. And here's what I mean. I get this where students will say 331 minus 23.1 divided by 52.33. And they get this for their answer and it's incorrect. So you have to be careful here. Your calculator is using PEMDAS. And if you remember from PEMDAS, division overrides subtraction. So the calculator is gonna do the division first and then subtract. And what I mean by that is your calculator is gonna do 23.1 divided by 52.33, whatever that number is and then subtract it from 331. And what you want to have happen is you want them to subtract first and then divide. Because anytime you have fractions, they've got their own secret parentheses around them protecting that numerator. So there's a couple of ways you can do this in your calculator. It just depends on what you prefer. You can use your parentheses. Right? And your parentheses are above your eight and nine key. You can see my left and right parentheses there. So what I can do is I can put my numerator, I can protect it, 331 minus 23.1, close that parentheses, and then divide by 52.33, and you'll get that 5.88 number, which is correct. Great. Uh, 
what I tend to do is I'll just find the numerator first, all right, which is 307.9. And then I'll put it in ratio to the denominator of 52.33. And I'm going to crunch that in a moment. But I just want to talk about this. So on this numerator is this particular student's deviation, right? distance from the mean. So you can see this student deviated from the mean by about 308 website visits. This student was well above the mean. All right. So that's that particular student's deviation. And we're going to put that in ratio to the standard deviation because all of these students deviated from the mean. None of these students had exactly 23.1 web page visits. They all deviated and the average deviation is also pretty large, 52. There was a lot of variability here. But I want to look at this ratio, student's deviation to average deviation. So let me divide that by 52.33. And there is my 5.884, or however many digits you want to round to. So this student was almost six standard deviations above the mean. And when we get to chapter six, you're going to see, we're going to come to learn that most observations are within three standard deviations of the mean. So either three above or three below. So to be almost six above the standard deviation, excuse me, almost six standard deviations above the mean is just a huge number because this is an extreme outlier. At least back in Cal Poly 2009, this was an abnormally large number of times to visit that website in that month.